M that is something like the affinity that's very high, inappropriate for the cell. And they called it induced fit. And in this case, I would say something very similar to what happens in enzymes is happening in the selectivity filter of the potassium channel. So I want to summarize this, the principles of high selectivity and high conduction rate by saying that there are eight oxygen atoms surrounding potassium ions that form a selective coordination shell at each site. That sequential sites bind two potassium ions in either one, three, or two, four configurations. And two ions in close proximity tend to repel each other and favor rapid conduction. And to enter the two ion conducting states, a conformational change occurs. This change will cause potassium to bind with lower affinity and conduct more rapidly. Now, the main focus of my talk is on the selective conduction of potassium, but I want to say something about channel gating. That is, the process by which channels open and close. Here on the bottom, I show a channel record, an electrical recording of a channel undergoing its doing what it does. And what is graphed here on the y-axis is current, and on the x-axis is time. And what you see in a record like this is the current will remain at, sometimes at a zero level, and then it will jump up to a, to a non-zero level, and then you'll see it go back down, and it will come up and down. What you see is the current is turning on and off. And what we say is, the channel is opening and closing. And we have in mind a picture, like I've shown here. A closed potassium channel with a gate or a door covering its pore. And then an open potassium channel that is conducting ions by a mechanism that I've been talking about. And the switching between on and off would correspond to the gate opening and closing. Now, what's really happening here? How does a potassium channel open and close? This is back to the classification of potassium channels, and I told you that more complicated potassium channels, they all have a pore, like the one I've been talking about, but they have additional protein components added to them. Ligand-dependent channels usually have protein added to the C-terminal side of the pore, and voltage-dependent channels have extra protein added to the N-terminal side of the pore. And this extra protein allows the channel to respond to a specific stimulus so that it opens under the right condition, in a sense so that it opens in the cell when it's called upon. Now, quite a few years ago, we decided we want to see what these more complicated channels look like to try to understand gating, the structural basis of gating. And the, again, this has been a team effort, but there's one postdoctoral scientist that I want to mention, Yuxing Zhan, because he's actually determined the structure of both a ligand-dependent ion channel, this kind, and a voltage-dependent ion channel, this kind. These two channels are called KVAP, the voltage-dependent channel, an MTHK, a calcium-dependent channel. The ligand is calcium. Now, the KVAP is from a thermophilic archaea. MTHK is from a thermophilic bacterium. Despite the high temperature prokaryotic origins of these channels, um, they have counterparts or th channels that are very similar in eukaryotic cells. The, 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 res the gating response to the stimulus is shown in channel records here. For KVAP, you can see the voltage dependence of gating. If you have the channel in the membrane and you hold the membrane at a negative voltage inside with an external amplifier and then depolarize the membrane, what you see is the channel is closed at negative and that it opens for a while. It tends to open when you depolarize the membrane or make it positive on the inside. You see these are repeated traces. And you can see that it's the stepping of the voltage that makes this channel open. And this process is related to additional, this called a voltage sensor, attached beside the pore. The voltage sensor is a helical structure. It has positive charged arginines on it. 
and we have a long way to learn about the details for how this is working, but what we know is that the component with the positive charges move a long way through the membrane in association with membrane depolarization to open the pore. This gating stimulus for the calcium-dependent channel is shown here. In the absence of calcium, the channel is open very infrequently, but then if calcium is raised inside the cell, the channel opens more. And in fact, at high concentrations, you could see that there were two channels in this membrane. So in this case, it's calcium that's causing the channel to open. And what causes that to happen is this large component, this calcium sensor attached not in the membrane, but on the cytoplasmic or intracellular side of the channel. And let's now take a closer look at that in this picture. Here is the pore of the potassium channel. So this would be in the membrane. And here is the calcium sensor. We call this big thing a gating ring. And in, for a technical reason, in the structure, the electron density connecting the pore to the gating ring is not well defined, so I show it as dotted lines here. And we, again, like in the voltage-dependent channel, there's still much to be learned about how this works. But the general idea is this, that the gating ring changes its shape when calcium binds to it. And that shape change causes the pore, pulls the pore open. In this, is, in this way, it can act as a calcium sensor to open and close the pore. Now, the interesting thing for our point here is that this crystal structure was determined in the presence of a high concentration of calcium. And in fact, calcium is bound, marked by yellow spheres here. Calcium is bound to this structure, so we know it should be in its shape to open the pore. And in fact, if you look at this pore, and you're observant, you'll notice, you'll say, well, he said the pores are the similar in all the channels, but you'd see some difference between this pore and the one we've been looking at. And something I didn't tell you before is the pore of the KCSA channel that we've been looking at was in its closed conformation. And this one is in the open conformation. And so now by comparing them, we can get an idea of how a potassium channel can open and close, what that would look like inside the membrane. So now we'll look just at this part of a, clo of a closed and an open potassium channel. And here is looking through the pore of a potassium channel from inside the cell. If you were, imagine yourself inside looking out through the pore, this would be the KCSA, a closed potassium channel, and here is the MTHK, an open potassium channel. You can see that in the closed state, these helices, the inner helices, come very close together. And if the side chains, if I put the side chains here, you would see it would only be about three, three and a half angstroms, very narrow, and make a blockage for potassium, not allowing it to go through. But when a channel opens, it opens to more than 10 angstroms diameter. And if we look at the same thing from the side with only two subunits, this is the closed configuration, and this is the opened configuration. Closed, opened. It's really a large conformational change, but it's a very simple one. Notice that what's happening here is this inner helix is bending at the point shown in red. I step back and forth between, and the helix swings out to open the pore. Now, if you align many different potassium channel sequences, whether they have voltage sensors or calcium sensors or other ligand sensors attached to them, you find that most of them have a glycine at this position, and glycine allows an alpha helix to bend. So we call this a gating hinge. And its conservation makes us think that many potassium channels, in fact, gate in this way. And so, when you look at the channel record and see the ionic current turning on and off, we imagine what happens is the channel opens, is opening and closing in the membrane, opening to let the current conduct and closing to stop it. In the voltage sensor, or the ligand sensor attached to it allows the channel to respond to a certain stimulus. 
and the sensor causes this to happen. And that's how the opening and closing is regulated. Now, if we look at the open conformation, imagine the membrane is from here to here. This is very wide. And so a potassium ion diffusing remains fully hydrated. In a sense, the potassium channel thins the membrane just to the length of the selectivity filter. And I say that because if you were a potassium ion diffusing through, you would be essentially in bulk water when trying to cross the membrane, except when you come to the selectivity filter. And that's with a mechanism we talked about where there's a beautiful structure and a beautiful mechanism to ensure selective and rapid conduction of potassium. And I want to end with the last picture of that selectivity filter. Here in a, in a, a picture that highlights the coordination of potassium ions. And I think when one looks at this picture, you can't help but marvel at the, at, at the beauty of nature, even at the atomic scale. And finally, I want to say that this work would not have been possible if it were not for the enthusiastic young scientists coming to work with me uh, from all around the world over the past 15 years. And I want to show you a list of their names, and I wish I could have time to tell you about them all. I just want to mention two important collaborators at Rockefeller University, Brian Chite, mass spectrometrist, and um, Tom Muir, protein synthetic chemist in work we've been doing for the past several years. I want to point out a few people who have been very important to the work that I talked about today. Declan Doyle, Joao Marai Cabral, here we were quite a few years ago on preparing to go on one of, you know, too numerous to count synchrotron tri trips to determine the structure of the original potassium channel structure. This is Yufeng Zhou, and this is a recent picture after she had knew what the absolute occupancy of potassium ions in the selectivity filter was. This is Yuxing Zhang, who uh, determined the structures of the ligand-gated and voltage-gated channels, but this was long before we knew what those structures were. This is my mentor, Chris Miller, who started me in science and is a continued inspiration for me. And for anybody who wonders how my lab continues to be so productive and so smooth, wants to know how that happens, uh, Alice Lee McKinnon, here's the real reason uh, why. And um, again, I want to thank Rockefeller University, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and the National Institutes of Health, and also for the synchrotrons, uh, the radiation sources that make this work possible. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.